Brothers and sisters, please join me in prayer. Almighty God, gracious and heavenly Father, this morning we continue our Advent observance and celebration as we await the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, both on Christmas morning and in the second Advent that he promises us when he tells us in his word that he will return. As we await the coming day, O Lord, prepare our hearts and minds as we gather together as your people. May your Holy Spirit fill this space with his presence, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you alone, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, some of you may know that before I began pursuing a call to ministry, I was completing an undergrad degree in advertising. And while I never used my degree to pursue any kind of a career in advertising, I have to admit I always appreciated some of the classes that I was required to take at Liberty. Uh, some of my assignments included things like filming commercials, uh, designing billboard ads, uh, conducting surveys to help understand uh, certain target markets. Uh, looking back, it was overall a fun degree uh, to complete. Well, for one assignment, I was required to write a script for an ad for Buick, the car manufacturer. And the challenge for this assignment was to make Buick appealing for early 20-year-olds, post-graduates. So I conducted a survey among all the graduate schools at Liberty, at the business seminary and nursing schools. And I asked post-grads what kinds of things they looked for when they were shopping for a new car to buy for themselves. One of the questions I had on the survey was a long list of words like speed, luxury, style, mileage. And their job was to rank their top three words that they would look for when they were shopping for a new car. And when I conducted the survey and got all the results, to my surprise, the number one word that postgrads were looking for in a car wasn't speed, it wasn't style, it wasn't mileage. But the number one thing that they were looking for in a car was comfort. Above a fast car or an attractive car or a multi-purpose car, postgraduates were looking for a comfortable car. That answer fascinated me at the time. It fascinated me because we know a car's purpose isn't to make us comfortable. Cars are for getting us from point A to point B, and yet it's comfort that these young 20-year-olds were looking for in a car above everything else. And I have to confess, when I got that answer, I, I kind of chuckled to myself and said, are you kidding me? Those 20-year-olds have no taste in cars. But then I had a reality check when I turned the question around and said, well, what would my top three words be if I were looking for a car? And as a 6'8 man who would have to travel quite a bit for my naval training, I realized comfort would absolutely have to be one of my top three words on that list. Now, I suspect whether we're willing to admit it or not, if we conducted a similar survey here at Grace, we would probably find a similar result. And I suspect this because it's natural, it's almost hardwired in us as human beings to seek comfort as a priority. If you remember from school Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know that triangle that lists all the human needs that people have. The number one and most basic need that human beings have is physical, food, water, rest. But the very next need after those physical needs is safety, security, in other words, comfort. This morning, God declares comfort, comfort my people. And in light of our human desire for comfort, this should cause us to reflect on what God means specifically by comfort. And for me, I believe when it comes to comfort today, the church can put herself in a situation of two equally dangerous extremes. The first extreme is equating God's comfort with our ideal human desire for being comfortable. This is the same kind of comfort those postgrads were looking for in a car. Nice leather seats, leg room, good cooling and, and heating. The idea is because God promises us comfort, and because most people prioritize comfort, then the church is supposed to be comfortable. Church should never be a place that makes anyone feel uncomfortable or anxious or insecure. But church should be all about making people feel as comfortable and secure as it possibly can. And what makes people feel the most comfortable? Well, overall, it's things that we're familiar with. 
And what's more familiar in 21st century America than the coffee shops that we like, the entertainment seating that we have in our homes, the music we listen to on the radio, and people who look and dress like we do? So they said, let's make church more like that. Let's make church a place where the world can come in and feel right at home. Now, what's more comfortable than that? Now, to be sure, that's an appealing vision for the church. That's why megachurches have hundreds of members, and we at Grace only have about 50. But it's all built on the assumption that the comfort God offers us is the comfort that we seek in our everyday lives. I recently listened to an interview of a Lutheran pastor. This is a Lutheran pastor I've actually met before. And he was answering questions about his particular church and his ministry and and his call there. And at one point, the interviewer asked, you know, Pastor so-and-so, I went to visit your church this past Sunday, and I expected you to wear those, you know, church gown things that you Lutherans tend to wear. But you were in street clothes. Now, Now, why is that? And this was his answer. Well, you know, I thought about it, and I decided I didn't want to make visitors feel uncomfortable. A 2,000-year-old Christian custom, a 2,000-year-old formative educational identifying marker of a minister in Christian worship thrown completely out the window, all for the sake of comfort. Now, to be clear, I don't wear vestments because I'm better or more holy than pastors who don't. The Lord knows that I'm not. I wear vestments, and I will always wear vestments while I'm ordained, because I'm not better than those pastors who've been wearing vestments for the past 2,000 years. When we prioritize comfort over who we are, we forsake what sets us apart from the world. It starts with little things like getting rid of our traditions. But soon it all adds up to the lie that our faith is about making the world more comfortable. But that's not the gospel. And it's a lie because how comfortable was St. Peter when he was being crucified upside down? How comfortable was St. Bartholomew when he was skinned alive for his faith in Jesus Christ? And worst of all, how do we reconcile comfortability with the central image, the central icon of our faith, a dead Messiah hanging on a cross? If the church believes it can sell that kind of comfort to the world, then the church will have nothing to offer the world than it can't already find in a coffee shop or a theater or a concert. But the truth is the gospel never promises a comfortable life to its followers but instead it prepares us for the discomfort our lives constantly throw in our direction. C.S. Lewis perhaps said it best. I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of port could do that. If you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. That's the first extreme in how the church can interpret God's comfort, a kind of soft comfort that seeks to satisfy the world's material needs. The second extreme today is ignoring the idea of God's comfort entirely. Now, I find this is usually a reaction to the first extreme. It sees the Christian culture of comfort in America today, and it goes in the complete opposite direction to say, no, God's not some softy but he's a harsh, uncompromising authority, so get back in line because he's just waiting to pour out his wrath on you. This is a Christian culture of all law and no gospel. And to be sure, great sermons should confront us with the reality of God's law and how we fall short. But in this extreme, that's where it ends. It points the finger at the assembly to get right with God, to do this, to man or woman up, to fix that, and then it says, Amen. In this view, comfort is a weakness. Comfort makes us soft, and the American church has had enough comfort already. So now it's time to wake people up with shocking hellfire and brimstone messages that make them as uncomfortable in their pews as possible. 
We find this extreme in many well-intentioned conservative Christian leaders today, where the only measure of how great a sermon or teaching is is by how convicting it is or how guilty it makes listeners feel about their sin. In other words, how uncomfortable it makes its listeners. So where's the balance to be found between these two extremes? What's the middle ground between one side that says the church should be all about the business of making people comfortable, and the other side that says the church should ignore the idea of finding comfort entirely? Well, it begins with hearing God's word for us this morning. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Listen to how God's word confirms two realities, two truths at the exact same time. On one hand, God's word is clear that we are sinners, that no matter how well behaved we think we are, no matter how hard we try to resist it, we are all guilty of offending God by ignoring his law in different ways. All of us. The clearest example of this is in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount when he tells us this. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, But I say to you that anyone who looks at another with lustful intent has committed adultery already. You have heard that it was said, you shall not murder. But I say to you that anyone who hates their brother or sister is liable to judgment. Have any of us come here this morning guilt-free of this? Can any of us honestly look inward and say, I have a clean slate and haven't done or felt anything like that? I think we all know the answer. This is one thing our anti-comfort extremists get right. God's law is harsh, it's uncompromising, it reveals our guilt and rightly accuses us. That is the truth. But they fall short in their remedy. When they say we stand guilty so we need to do A, B, C, X, Y, Z, what does God say? Comfort. Comfort my people. Lord, I committed adultery in my heart this week. Forgive me. God says, comfort. Lord, I harbored so much anger against my neighbor, my friend, or my spouse this week. God says, comfort. Why? Because as Isaiah says, our warfare with this world has ended. And it ended when God became man and the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our iniquity is pardoned because God carried our guilt to Calvary and nailed it to the cross with his very own flesh. And we stand accused of sin, but God grants us double the amount of that sin in his abundant grace. That, that, brothers and sisters, is the comfort of Almighty God. It isn't a comfort that guarantees a painless, stress-free life without hardship. In fact, God's word guarantees that life is going to be full of these things. Instead, the comfort of God comes from knowing that despite all the things that we may face, pain, stress, hardship, sickness, that the everlasting word of God comforts grace and gives us peace stands forever and will triumph in victory over all of these things. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. We have peace and comfort with God through the life, death, and resurrection of his son. Let us prepare for his coming. Prepare the way of the Lord by living in accordance with this great comfort that he gives us. Not denying hardship, but embracing it for the sake of our neighbor. Not reveling in God's wrath, but proudly rejoicing in our salvation from it. As the empty manger lies ready to receive the newborn baby in Bethlehem, 
Let us empty ourselves and make ourselves ready to receive the everlasting comfort granted to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.